Well, good afternoon. Thank you for staying. As my name is Malcolm Sparrow. It's my pleasure to chair this session. Um, this session was put together at uh, Peter Nehru's initiative, uh, so that we should have a discussion about this. Um, I have traveled all the way from America, and I'm learning a new English word in preparation for this session. The word is uh, zemiology. Um, you should note that down. Um, you should know what it means by the end of this session. Uh, it was coined, I think, by Hilliard and Toombs, and uh, in summary form, it's about the study of social harms. We're going to be talking about uh, the value that uh, is to be created by focusing more on the, crime, uh, the, on this, on the harm uh, resulting from crime and the harms of other types, and the way that that feeds both into police uh, prioritization and resource management and into other decisions within the criminal justice system. Um, and even the possibility of what should be criminalized in the future if it isn't already. Our two speakers, I'll introduce them briefly together at the beginning. Peter Nehrud is former chief executive officer for the National Policing Improvement Agency. And before that, he was chief constable of the Thames Valley Police in England. I was awarded a QPM in 2004 and a CBE in 2011. And now, having retired from the police, he uh, works as a lecturer in evidence-based policing at the Institute of Criminology at the University of Cambridge. Peter's going to talk about the development of the Cambridge Crime Harm Index in the UK um, and equivalent efforts in other countries, um, and will tell us what that uh, has already demonstrated um, in terms of affecting police operations. Uh, our second speaker is Leticia Pauli. Um, she is a criminologist, uh, professor of criminology, originally from Tuscany. She has been uh, professor at the law faculty at Leuven University since 2006. She um, has been writing uh, recently with uh, Victoria Greenfield, who is listed in your program as another speaker for this session. Uh, Victoria is not able to be with us uh, this afternoon, so Leticia will be doing that uh, by herself. Um, their writing has uh, examined this concept in the context of legal history and philosophy and legal theory, um, and they also have developed a harm assessment framework, um, which they're going to recommend and show us how it can be applied in practice. So first uh, to Peter, thank you very much. Thank you, Malcolm, uh, and thank you all for staying, rather than going off and changing for the for the dinner. This will be this will be will be worth your while, we promise. Um, and actually, particularly given we just heard uh, Herman talk about some of the things, some of the ambitions that he that uh, he has for problem-oriented policing. I'm hoping that what we'll be able to do is convince you that harm is one dimension that we should be playing increasingly into this and into thinking about. Uh, criminal justice and criminal justice outcomes. Uh, slightly indulgent to put a picture of yourself up early on in a, uh, in a lecture, but it's just to kind of remind you that this is, that, uh, that, and, and I'll talk a little bit, a little bit more about this, about the, 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 the moment that Larry pointed out in that uh, introduction to Herman, where we were talking about volume. That was the moment I came in uh, t and, and pro problems as, uh, in terms of rapid response. That's the moment I came in as a police officer and by the time I exited, I think I'd only just come to terms with some of the, the issues. One of the great joys of, I think the phrase you used was retired. I don't feel very retired. Uh, but the, the, one of the great joys of being able to come out and be reflective is the ability to look back in and see opportunities for change. So hopefully I'll be able to convince you of that. And this is where I came in. And I can see one or two colleagues in the room as well who also came in at that point. Um, this was a piece of work I did when I was a, a newly appointed police officer, a graduate in history. Uh, I'm not quite sure how that qualified me to design a new policing scheme, but critically it came just exactly as, as Herman's book describes. Uh, we were rushing around. Uh, we were rushing around, chasing our tails. You can see there a figure of nearly 90% of what we were doing was being driven by mobile response. This was a this was the, a policing scheme in a part of Hampshire where, where I was given the task of shifting it and changing it. And you can see that 
Molly Weatherit writing a book about innovations in policing 86 described me as a bright young constable. Just like to make that point. Promise not always fulfilled. Um, and, but what, we, what I tried to do, because I did what any good historian would do, which is go and read the texts, and one of them was the one that Larry put up in that earlier session, which was Herman's 1979 uh, problem-oriented policing, and we sat down and we designed a, a, a policing scheme which was about problem-solving, about an intelligence-led focus to crime and incident concentrations, about trying to use technology. I'd like to point out the computer we had had 64K. It was great. Uh, it could just about count. Um, and enhancing supervision, because one of the other things that Herman's book talks about is improving the quality and the proactivity of supervision as well. So we had a pretty good go, 1981, at trying to deliver on that early agenda and some of the early work on uh, problem-oriented policing. And we added to that, a couple of years later, a, uh, I think one of the very early attempts to try and do um, hotspot policing with, uh, with, uh, with developing maps. Admittedly, at that stage, we didn't have a computer capable of doing the maps. So we stuck pins, pins, and then, of course, when you get a real hotspot, we had the pins coming out about six inches because we just had pins on top of pins on top of pins. So it did, the technology was basic, and we spent a fortune on pins. We used to get constant requests about why we were spending so much money on pins. And alongside that as well, which is what we were trying to do, uh, the little group of us who were driving this, was to try and realize Herman's ambition that this was not just about uh, making, making changes. This was about making a much, this was about much bigger reform to a policing department, a, diff a different way of doing things and a different ambition. Uh, sorry, that's my copy of his book with a very nice uh, signature in it, which I am very proud because this was my driving spirit at the time and a constant companion, as it was for a number of us in this room uh, in that process. And it was, it was, it, it, it was a kind of a major disappointment looking back that we just didn't succeed. And I don't think we're alone. We've heard, I think, a number of presentations through this conference about some of the challenges of those early implementations of problem-oriented policing. Some of it was because we just had not got the science that we now have about how small you have to go. Uh, the clusters that you need to tackle to make real difference had to be quite small and quite tight. We didn't measure things other because we would, you know, we were reliant on what the force had at that stage, which was primarily <laughs> crime measures and basically volume crime measures as well, and I'll come on to that. We didn't have big enough data to be able to really make a good job of it. And we didn't test things properly. We, we were very much on the basis of, of the you know, kind of classic police officer stance, which I've got to say, every time any of my students try and stand up and, or, or say this when, it, when, when they're in the master's class, they get told to sit down again, which is if they ever say, I did this and therefore this happened, they get to sit down again, because that is just simply not good. It's either good, neither good science nor good policing because you really have to be more reflective about uh, why and how and measure things properly uh, in order to work out whether you did it. And we didn't. And we certainly didn't track things properly. And we suffered from the, from the problems that uh, Ed McGuire has uh, documented in a very good study of policing in uh, problem oriented policing in Colorado Springs of low dosage and low fidelity. We didn't do it well enough, and we didn't do it in the way that we ought to have done. And those are kind of 30-year lessons. But we also suffered from the fact that for, for really for that most of my career, we were constantly measuring volume crimes as if one crime was the same as another crime. And therefore, we tended to focus on problems where there was a heap of stuff rather than thinking about being able to, to, to parse it and work out what was more important. And this really came home to me when, as the uh, chief executive of the National Policing Improvement Agency, I was trying very hard to get British police forces off the alcohol and drugs of targets. And I expressed it this way, that targets let dangerous offenders go free because what had actually happened was that in order to meet targets, forces were going out and trying to detect pedal cycle crimes. Now, you know, I don't want my pedal cycle stolen, but I sure as hell want my murders and rapes dealt with more effectively. Um, and I would certainly like to think that police forces would have the capacity to focus on things like um, serious abuse to children and, and human trafficking and some of the other problems that are less easy to count and much, and much more difficult to deal with. Incidentally, I, when, I, when this appeared on the front page of the Times, I was reading it by doing what I shouldn't have been doing, which was walking down a street trying to read the Times and work out which idiot had said this and was going to get a load of stick 
at which point Gordon Brown rang me to say that I'm about to stand up to do to be Prime Minister's questions, and I walked into a lamppost, which was really not a good thing. So crime harm has an immediate impact. Herman put it this way when he, in, in, his, in his book. He talked about problems as being about behaviour, about territory, about persons, and about time. And it's a really important analysis. But he also posed the question, what should get the highest priority? Because, as he said in the last session, the police can't do everything. If they try to do everything, they won't do it well. But they, or more than that, he was also saying the police should not do everything. And therefore, there's a process of deciding what should come first. In the book, he talks about the impact of the, of the problem, and he talks about the presence of life-threatening conditions. Now, we could do that just by crime classification, but actually, as... Larry, myself, and my daughter have developed, we can do some better work in this, and we can highlight this. Because he goes on to talk about the concentration of attention on individuals who account for a disproportionate share of the problem. So how do we measure that? How do we put that at the front of our processes? And in policing, you have to work with the weft of the culture, which means you are going to have to have some form of formal measurement. Um, as you heard, you may have heard the uh, the, the Swedish Minister of Justice say, you know, I'm, if I'm going to give you 22,000 extra officers, I am sure as hell going to want to measure you, in which case we need to find better measures. And I would add to Herman's list of individuals the places and victims who, 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 where, where a disproportionate amount of crime happens or who experience a disproportionate amount of crime. And Larry Sherman developed that in terms of the idea of the power few, this constant search for that small proportion of, the, of any particular population either or place or victim where the most harm is concentrated. But how do, you, how do you realistically assess that? Because what we've tended to do is we've looked at crime figures. We have this constant perpetual hand-wringing process where crime figures come out, come out. If they've gone down, that's good. The police are doing their job. If they go up, that's not so good. Um, and, then, and then the usual cry is, well, actually, we've lost a few police officers or we need a few more. I, I summarise a much longer debate, but actually in the UK there's a pretty reasonable claim for the latter. But actually if you then turn those crimes into harm, you get a very different and much sharper picture. And when we turn that into harm, we do it by doing what I'm about to describe, which is weighting the individual in, uh, crimes and trying to, get a, trying to get a different take, and a take that is a much sharper focus. And what we've built, which I'm about to explain how we've done it, um, we built a thing called the Cambridge Crime Harm Index. It's a very operational way of turning crimes, turning away from simple volume crimes into finding a way to wait and to focus and to sharpen that process and to run alongside uh, the, the, the current approach. In the UK, we have sentencing guidelines. I stress not every country has sentencing guidelines, and I'll come on to how you solve that problem where you don't have sentencing guidelines. And they're, they're developed by a structured process of consultation particularly in terms of going out and actually doing social science research with victims, uh, with, uh, with, uh, the, with, with the wider public, with the judiciary, with police officers and others working in the field. And then going out and consulting about specific, specific tariffs. So there is a clear democratic approach, starting with the legislation that sets the overall tariffs and working through to the publication of guidelines. And then having worked out that we actually had a, a fairly comprehensive set of weightings, because sentencing clearly gives you a weighting, the question is which bit of the sentencing process to use. And we, 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 deci we went for and decided that we would go with the starting point. In UK terms, that's the starting point that someone who has not previously been convicted could expect to start at when they appear on the first appearance. So it's unweighted for, the, for, any, for their, con their previous convictions. So, for example, it hasn't got any of the aggravating factors on the left-hand side of the screen, nor has it got any of the mitigating factors that might come from the individual, whether that be they, they pleading guilty, whether it's about remorse or whatever. It hasn't got any of that. It's the unvarnished tariff to start the process off. And it also, it also avoids ending up merely setting the tariff for particular offenses on the basis of the most serious example of it. We're talking about the base base case, the, nor the, the normal, 
version of that offence. And it also, it also it removes the specific factors that judges have to consider, which are about culpability and all the other bits and pieces that you add on as you go through the sentencing process in the UK. So the starting point. And you take the starting point and you, multi and you take that starting point and either convert it in, into, into days in prison or you, or you, for example, take a, a days of a community sentence or you take the number of days it takes to earn the amount that a fine would be set at. So you're converting something into a standard measure, number of days in prison. And in this case, this is, this is an example with a, um, with a, with a, community, with a community order. So you, you'll find, you're trying to find a consistent measure across the piece. And by the way, we've now been able to do that for, well, for, for, for over 1,500 offences across the whole of corpus of, the UK, of UK criminal justice. And what we do is we take, we take the sentencing guidelines, we turn it into the number of days of prison, and we now have, if you want to look it up in particular, it's on the Cambridge Institute website, you can see our uh, spreadsheet with all of the values for sentencing types across the whole piece, from, ranging from homicide through to uh, shoplifting. The critical thing about this, of course, is when you do this weighting, you end up with a huge variation in terms of harm between homicide at round about 5,500 days of imprisonment down to shoplifting standard theft, which is going to be two, one or two days uh, in those terms. So those are, that's the weighting we apply. Now, some immediately, what, the, the problem with that is moving across jurisdictions where, for example, as in Australia, uh, there aren't any sentencing guidelines in Western Australia. So one of our students uh, went, went, through, went, went, through, went to an alternative way of developing that process, which is taking the, the, total, the total number of, of, of sentences awarded for particular types of crime and then looking at the, 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 where, where those of, all those sentences which were awarded, as it says on this funnel, to first-time offenders only. So taking out, again, taking out all the pre-convictions, taking all the sentences values awarded for first-time offenders, and then and applying that to 103 sampled offences, which were the most common offences, which account for nearly 90% of all, of all offences sentenced in the, in the Australian court. And having a pretty sizable sample of uh, offences over, over time, and then doing the same process of taking those sentencing outcomes uh, averaged across the piece and converting them into, into days imprisonment. And you might think, well, actually, wouldn't that end up with very different values? And the answer to that is, interestingly, not. Uh, so one of the, the, the pieces that I, that I encouraged Paul, because I was a supervisor, to do was to see whether doing it that way would actually result in very significant differences between sentencing and sentencing, a sentencing-based uh, harm, harm index in Australia and a sentencing-based uh, sentencing guidelines-based approach in the UK. And you can see the table. The, there is a remarkably high level of correlation across Australia, and we've all, he also added the Canadian Crime Severity Index, the New Zealand Crime Harm Index, and we could now add the Danish Crime Harm Index, uh, Swedish Crime Harm Index. We're in the process of developing a Hong Kong Harm Index. Uh, we've, we've got a Japanese Harm Index developing, and we want to, we, we want, we're trying to develop a, uh, a series of international, international standards and also to look across them to see how consistent they are. But on first, first, first look across the ones that, we, that, we, that have been developed by the time that Paul did his thesis, it looks, pretty, it looks pretty consistent, and that therefore makes it, I think, much more robust and much more reliable in those terms. But what, you might think, does that mean for practice? It's one thing to have built a, a, a framework, but the, the article that we wrote was very much, very much around how would you deploy this in practice. And the critical thing, if you take it against uh, Larry Sherman's framework of the triple T, is that we're really focused on targeting. We're focused here on getting the police to focus on the most harmful crimes, the most harmed victims, and the most harmful offenders as a priority. And by the way, that also frees, frees the police up to think, as, as Herman was encouraging us to think, about what you might do if you have someone who's, who's committed a very much less harmful offense, whose profile is predicted to be much less harmful, um, and 
and therefore the potential to think about other ways of dealing with somebody outside the criminal justice system or indeed encouraging other agencies and other organisations to, to, to deal with the problem. And I start with, because it's an obvious place to start, uh, with hotspot policing, which we know from study after study, it's, one of, it's got the most number of, of uh, experimental and high quality studies of any of the specific intervention strategies, it is, it, it, which has a very high level of consistency ac across the piece. And hotspot policing is pretty effective at reducing crime. Um, at this, it would be, as the co-chair of the Campbell Collaboration, it would be remiss of me not at some point to include a forest plot in a presentation. And there is your forest plot for the afternoon. Uh, but it, broadly speaking, demonstrated that it has a significant effect on crime counts. The question is, what, would it what effect might it have on crime harm? And what, would, it, would it look differently if we were looking at crime harm? So over the course of uh, the last two or three years, with most, particularly with our students, we run a program which is about applied policing for, for, uh, for mostly middle and senior ranks in policing. Um, and we are particularly focused on getting them to use these tools in practice in the field. This happens to be uh, Leicester, and it's, it's illustrating that actually the harm spots and hot spots, so volume and calm, don't necessarily exist in the same places. Of course, the interesting ones are the places where there is a coincidence between the two as well, but they're not necessarily the same places, or indeed, do they, does it highlight the same type of problems? And it's important for, to, to remember that the debate in the UK about what, where policing has failed has fundamentally been, over the last three or four years, about the failure to notice serious harm, relatively low volume issues, uh, well, not that low volume in some communities, but issues like the exploitation of vulnerable children and missing people. Um, and this, this, technique tend, this technique of applying crime harm as well as volume tends to highlight both issues. And just to make that point, the other advantage that are using crime harm to problems, uh, and as opposed to just using volume, is that crime harm is much more concentrated. So this happens to be a map of Birmingham showing the, um, showing the hot spots and, rough, and, it, and it roughly conforms to the, to the formula that you would expect if you've read the hotspot literature of 5% of places counting for around about 50% of your crimes. This is the harm spots in Birmingham. You can see the skyscrapers are taller and they're also more concentrated. If you put them alongside, you can see that very distinctly. And interestingly, they're also in slightly different places. Hotspots are less concentrated than harm spots. Harm spots are taller than hot spots. But critically, around about two around about two percent of the locations account for around about eighty percent of your harm. So the opportunity for the police to really focus their efforts and to really think about the most harmful problems lies in using these two analyses alongside each other. And just to illustrate that this isn't just about Birmingham, this is rather cool. Uh, illustration comes from Perth, and it just shows that the harm, sorry, I can't, it's almost irresistible to keep going to and fro. I think the first time that Larry and I saw this, we just kept doing this and going to and fro, because it is actually quite cool. Um, but critically, if you're a police commander and you're thinking about your problems in a, in a, in, as, as, as Herman said, in a holistic way, you would, I think, be, be very much wanting to start with, well, why? Are those, why are those differences? Why are those particular places and locations so much more harmful? And then start with the kind of detailed problem analysis that the discipline of problem-oriented policing would encourage you to do. And why, why is that so p particularly pertinent? Well, when hot spots become harm spots, which is very much what's happening in, uh, in was very much what's happened in London with the, uh, with a, with a current escalation of concern about gun crime and knife crime. We have seen some hotspots become significantly more harmful. Then, then the issue, the context really matters. And it really matters that the police are able to better understand where the harm spots are and particularly the type of tactics and approaches and problem solving that might be most pertinent, most justifiable and most evidence-based rather than this constant to and fro between a debate around increasingly uh, problematic policing tactics like stop and search applied as a sort of general tincture uh, 
across a whole area rather than being extremely focused and combining those sort of tactics with a very much more thoughtful, problem-oriented approach in which a series of strategies and tactics are linked together and focused and evaluated using a harm approach. And this matters as well for other areas where we are universally using powers. The development of technology, such as automatic number plate recognition, hugely welcomed in policing, but it tends to lead you in a direction that you might not want to go, which is that if you've ever sat in a car with an with a, with a automatic number plate reader, you will know that it is constantly pinging with the potential hits. It's constantly telling you that there are hot vehicles in, in the presence. And the tendency, of course, in the, in the older model of policing, where you're responding rapidly to calls, is that you are just going to focus on the, 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 mo the easy one, the car that's just in front of you, the, the problem that's just in front of you, rather than thinking about whether maybe, maybe you could focus on the most harmful because actually when you start looking at uh, the, the data on, on, uh, uh, on, on automatic number plate recognition, what you, end, what, you, what, you dis what you discover is there are a great number of high harm, potentially high harm alerts coming up, but the tendency is to focus over too much on the low harm results and outcomes, which therefore progressively, of course, gets us into a situation where the police are deploying, deploying their efforts with a piece of technology getting a lot of results in terms of, in t in terms of hits and outcomes, but actually overusing the power on low harm issues, not, not tackling some of the smaller number of high harm issues on the process. These are, these are just charts illustrating that where the, where, where the officers are uh, being, being more thoughtful about outcome and being more thoughtful about, the diff about, the, about whether to intercept or not intercept, where the potential lies for, for, for focusing crime harm, we could be much more appropriate and indeed be linking things like automatic, automatic number plate recognition to the same high harm, high crime places linked to the same type of uh, that, that collective problem solving approach that I talked about earlier and therefore using powers. And, uh, and it's one of the most powerful things to me about evidence-based policing. Evidence-based policing is about doing no harm and using police powers in the least harmful way to reduce the most harm, if that doesn't seem like a tautology. And that, that moves us on and then to a slightly different way of thinking about it, and I've got three, kind of three slides to, 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 to think about the real potential of this as we go forward. And that is the first is about people. 2% of people, as we know from the work that we've been doing both that Larry first did with colleagues in Philadelphia and we've, been rep we've replicated in the UK and Mike Barton is here from Durham is doing, using a similar technique in Checkpoint in, in Durham. We do know that around about 2% of your offenders will have a high harm prediction and this looks a pretty consistent, a bit like the 5% the of locations, that's, that's 50%. That five, those, those, there are 2% of your offenders and if you translate that, for example, into a major problem that the police are under pressure to deal with, there is an extraordinarily small group of people who are responsible for the most persistent, deadly, and harmful violence in domestic violence. Yet we tend to have a, a position where the police are being encouraged to use arrest powers across the whole board, a bit like the automatic number plate re recognition, rather than focusing on the deadly hundred who are responsible for a vast amount of the harm in domestic violence. And the, and the focus on that particular part of the problem could so, be so much more powerful as, an out, as, a, as a way of achieving outcome. And then, and then with, with victims there, we, we've, you know, we've had this time and time again, the, the important literature on, on uh, repeat victimization, which the police have tended to struggle to follow through on. But if we are very tightly focused on the harm to victims, we discover, as our, one of our students, Gavin Dudfield, did in Dorset, that a tiny proportion of the victims suffer a massive proportion of the most serious harm. Why are we not taking a focus which starts from the most harmed victims and works forward to how do we, how do we solve their problem rather than focusing on, on the other 94%, 96%, sorry. And this takes me to my kind of final, final point. If we can do this with, with places, if we can do this with people, and we can do this with, with, the, with, the, peop with the victims that the, the offend that offenders have offended against, then we're moving into the type of territory that Herman concluded his book with, which is that measuring effectiveness entails far more than counting familiar variables. 
that lend themselves to counting, such as numbers of arrests, numbers of reported crimes, numbers of calls for assistance. And we could move to a situation where the police are much better able to focus efforts, focus the most, the most intrusive law enforcement powers on the most harmful problems, and think creatively and with much more uh, capacity to be problem solving on the places, the people, and the victims where the problems are much less harmful and there's much more room for creativity. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, just a couple minutes for any clarifying questions um, about this presentation before you forget them. I have two quick questions. Really? Um, yes, I do. Um, <laughs> seriousness of an offense uh, at the court sentencing stage normally considers um, the seriousness of the underlying offense, uh, which we have an idea about, the history of the offender and the impact of the victim to recover. If I understand what you've done, you've taken out the history of the offender. Correct. Um, you've assessed the seriousness of the offense given these base sentencing guidelines. Yes. And you have not introduced the impact on the victim. No. Okay. Um, second question. Um, your harm spots. Um, I don't know what one homicide would look like in your harm spots diagrams, um, because if it's got five and a half thousand points, you could have a pattern of 20 other minor things and it's completely dwarfed by one isolated but very serious um, where there isn't actually a pattern worth investigating in that way. Um, can you, can you yeah, tell I us mean, how it looks? Right, so, that, so there, that you do need to look under the spots. Yeah. That's most definitely, that, that's most definitely the case. But our, our experience, and interesting, this is, I think this is quite important because the tendency with hotspot policing is it's been over-focused on for, for good reasons, because that's where the volume is. It's been over-focused on urban policing. Yes. And with urban policing, you tend to have large amounts of volume, and it's kind of easier to see the spots. What we've discovered alongside this is that this, this technique of, uh, of mapping harm spots is, is actually also important, in, right. particularly if you do it over a long enough period in n not such dense uh, urban areas, because, yeah. as you rightly point out, there may not be many issues, yeah. but it may well be the case that the, the harm spots have, have a significant cluster over time, and that that cluster, whilst it may include one murder, will also include a range of other quite serious events taking place. Right. And that may be an opportunity for some, the type of long-term prevention that Herman was talking about in the book. But right. yes, you must absolutely, it's the start of the debate to identify the harm spot. And then you need to look under it and discover what that cluster is and whether indeed there's a relationship between the clusters. But there does, from our early work, there does tend to be, and it does tend to be important to look at it. Very good, thank you. Uh, two minutes for any other clarifying questions at this point. Yes, sir. Hello. Um, so, uh, yeah, I wanted to pick up the point about impact, really, um, because obviously the harm index, if you were using it for resource allocation, would send the police into your high harm neighbourhoods. But there is the possibility that in the same way as not all crimes are created equal, not all victims are created equal, and you could have some high volume but low harm offences that are concentrated in a particular population yeah. group, that it has a massive impact um, on those particular individuals disproportionately. And, and, and therefore, is there not a danger that those neighbourhoods might get missed out? Uh, I, I quite carefully showed you hot spots and harm spots on the same slide, and I probably should have made more of the fact that when, we're talking, when I'm talking to, the, to students about this, I'm constantly encouraging them to think both volume and harm because in fact some of the most interesting, most interesting problem areas are the ones where there's a combination of the two. And the, the other corollary to that is we've also, we've also started to develop thinking about how, for example, you provide a harm weighting to things like uh, missing, missing people, uh, problems like antisocial behavior, things that, are, th things that wouldn't obviously fit within a sentencing framework, but nevertheless, if, if, if they're happening with enough re repetition, are quite clearly harmful. They may be at a lower level of harm, but there's certainly something the police, particularly if it's within the context of neighbourhood policing, ought to be paying attention to. So, yeah. Okay, very good. Letitia, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Does the micro work? Good. So, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here. I'm presenting you today not the classical empirical paper. I'm presenting you quite uh, 
tough uh, theoretical paper on, uh, as the title says, on the centrality of harm to crime and to crim criminal policy and the potential of harm assessment, not just to policing, but in general uh, to, uh, to different phases of criminal policy. As Malcolm said in the introduction, I would like to acknowledge that I'm, uh, my work, uh, I'm doing this work, uh, my work in this area together with uh, a US economist, Victoria Greenfield, who could not be here today. And Victoria and I have already a few years ago developed a methodology, uh, the harm assessment framework for assessing the harms of crime, but potentially also of uh, uh, non-criminalized activities. And uh, we think that how a methodology can really assess, as I will show you in a moment, the harms of crime rather than just the perceptions of the harms as they are enshrined in sentencing guidelines, for example. However, as I will explain later, I think that uh, our method is certainly more cumbersome, but perhaps also I would say more fundamental uh, than the crime harm index uh, developed that, uh, by Larry and uh, Peter. Uh, and I see the two as complementary rather than uh, uh, as opposing each other. I have presented this harm assessment framework in previous talk here, so I will be brief on the framework itself, on the details of the methodology. If you are interested in that, just send me an email. I, I will be happy to send you some publications on that. And Victoria and I have finalized a book with Oxford University Press on the assessment of the harms of crime, which will be out in early uh, 2019. So the other possibility is wait for the book. So these are uh, specifically the aims of my presentation. First of all, I would like to demonstrate the uh, centrality of the harms to crime and to societal responses of crime, irrespective of the ambiguity of uh, the idea of crime itself. And I will do that by first exploring harms place in legal history, legal theory, criminology and related fields, and then in different phases of criminal policy. So criminalization, crime control and policing, sentencing and punishment, victim assistance and restorative justice, crime prevention and reparation in international criminal justice. Concurrently, Victoria and I will also uh, examine whether sc legal scholars, criminologists, policymakers and others as conceptualize harms as separate from crime, and whether uh, those with a role in implementation have taken harm on board in uh, principle or in practice. Then I will briefly present you our conceptualization and operationalization of harms. And lastly, I will explore the potential of harm assessment uh, in criminal policies. So, and the structure of my talk matches this aim. However, before discussing harm in relation to crime, we have briefly to deal with the ambiguities of the concept of harm itself. Harm has been rightly defined as an essentially contextual uh, concept. So Galli coined this phrase to characterize concepts that are accepted notionally yet disputed widely in terms of meaning of use, in large part because they are both normative and complex. Indeed, how, uh, crime is an inherently normative concept, even if uh, mainstream criminologists have uh, for a long time tended to deny the normativity of, uh, uh, of harm, uh, just uh, focusing on a very small set of uh, uh, malign say or kind of natural crime. However, crime is the concept that our society uses uh, to express censure and blame, so it's unavoidably inherently normative. It's also complex, as there are many different debates going on on crime, and in this complex debate, the legal definitions represent an anchor However, they really simplify crime because uh, the legal definitions of crime are really tautological. They just say that something is crime because the laws define something as a crime. And they also obscure the link between uh, crime and harm. And uh, the very, uh, as criminal law is, uh, is becoming uh, a vast and growing and complex corpus on legal scholars uh, like, such as Ashford speak of uh, uh, the lost cause of criminal law. However, uh, despite of these ambiguities, through our extensive uh, literature review and document analysis, Victoria and I have aimed to show that there is a common thread, that this common thread is harm. The centrality of harm to crime uh, clearly emerges from legal history. Uh, um, the early uh, system that constitutes the foundation of Western law mostly did not define crime per se, 
However, through a combination of tort claim and public prosecutions, each body of law intended them to restore or to prevent injuries done to a specific interest that was deemed worth of protection. So harm back then was not just the breach of a law, huh? but a, 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 a law was uh, established in order to protect some interests. And the centrality of harm is also uh, clear from the sentences that were imposed, huh? because back then, in the early modern times, uh, or even before that, in the antiquity, uh, uh, the, many sentences were restorative, even for homicides in the Lex Salica, which is, uh, you have a picture there, uh, restoration was foreseen even for homicides. And it's only starting with the normal period that harm became, that crime started to be conceptualized as a, um, as a violation of uh, the ruler's authority. And gradually, criminal and tort law split, the victim was displaced by the, from the criminal process, and the criminal sanctions became increasingly uh, uh, retributive rather than restorative. The link between harm and crime nonetheless, was quite clear to the founding of contemporary legal theory. For example, Cesare Beccaria in his On Crimes and Punishment argued that crimes are only to be measured by the injury done to society. And Adam Smith in the same period argued that delinquency is founded upon damage done to any person, whether through malice or culpable negligence. And about uh, 90 years afterwards, huh, John Stuart Mill uh, formulated his uh, uh, harm principle, huh, which goes even farther by saying that uh, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harms to others. Uh, and even in contemporary legal theories, most scholars would argue that uh, would recognize the relevance of harm and agree, for example, with what Zedna says, that harm is quite as much as fault central to criminal liability. Uh, this centrality of harm to crimes also emerged from the concept of uh, the red school, the legal interest uh, in the Germanic legal traditions. Uh, even if uh, so harm not, is not necessarily accepted as the only uh, reason for criminalizing something by most contemporary uh, legal theories. However, uh, in uh, the doctrine, in the literature on this, uh, on criminalization, we find no detailed conceptualization of harm and not even a clear distinction between the harming event and the consequences, so the harm itself. Even in criminology, uh, there is perhaps even less attention given to harm. This has to do with the fact that uh, mainstream criminology is just focused on a, a on a limited uh, subset of uh, criminal activities, but one could argue that they too implicitly recognize the relevance to harms because of course the mala in se uh, are really the most harmful crimes. And indeed, most criminologists some way or another uh, recognize that crime produces harm. Think for example of Sutherland's definition of crime as socially injurious acts. The semiologists, so as Malcolm uh, pointed out, go even further by pointing, uh, by arguing that a separate discipline should be founded and focused or devoted to the study of uh, social harms. And harm is even relevant in green criminology, which focuses on the harms to the environment. However, here too, we see that there have been few conceptualization of harms and even fewer empirical assessment if harm is not reduced to either the cost of crime or to the perceived crime seriousness, so as perceived by the public or as perceived by policymakers and enshrined in uh, uh, sentencing guidelines or sentencing data. Harm is also central to uh, different phases of criminal policy, and I will be here very brief. Um, first of all, as I said, to criminalization. So harm reduction has been the main goal of, cr uh, of, crimin uh, in, of criminal law in both the US and Europe. Just read here, for example, the purpose set by criminalization by the American model penal code. Uh, the same uh, centrality of harm also emerges huh, from the uh, council European Council model provisions on criminal law. Criminal provisions should focus on conduct causing actual harm or seriously threatening the right 
or essential interests of different people. And despite the shift to retributivism, the centrality of harms also emerged for some, uh, from several trends. Huh? For example, the increasing enactment of strict liability offenses. But here too, we see no conceptualization or let alone empirical assessment of the harms. In crime control and policing, uh, uh, the, uh, the relevance or the centrality of harm is at first sight uh, less evident because often crime control is presented as a sufficient justification in itself. However, you have few countries and few agencies uh, that have made explicitly linked with harm. For example, uh, Finland uh, has stated since, uh, since the 1970s that the reduction of harm of both crime and crime control policies should be in the main arm, the main aim of uh, criminal policies itself. The relevance of harm to crime in this phase of criminal policy also emerges from the rise of serious crime. However, uh, there have been few specifications of harms, and indeed the crime harm index of uh, Larry's and PETA is one of the few exceptions in this field. Harm is also central to sentencing and punishment. Here, harm plays its central role through the idea of uh, the seriousness of the offense. Uh, both scholars and policymakers agree that the sentences should be proportional to the uh, seriousness of the offense, and the seriousness of the offense is defined as the harm done, risk by the act, and the offender's culpability. And even beyond retributism, retributivism, many scholars argue that sentences should restore the harm and not just be proportional to the, uh, to the harm uh, done. However, here too, we see that except for the seminal work of von Hirsch and Yarebor, there has been no conceptualization of harm, of the harms of crime, uh, and no empirical assessment. So that even our sentences, both in the criminal law uh, codes and in the sentencing guidelines, are not really based on an empirical assessment of the harm. There is instead an empirical literature on the harms of, imp of imprisonment. However, this literature does not, does not always make its assessment criteria explicit, or at least uses partial criteria. Harm is obviously central huh, to the idea of victims, to victims' programs, and to restorative justice. However, in these areas too, we see that uh, the idea of harm has not necessarily been clarified. For example, victimology has most studied uh, harms to individuals and only to individuals qualitatively, emphasizing the variance of impact. And in restorative justice, more emphasis is among other plays on the process rather than on the, out, uh, on the final outcome, so whether or not the harm is effectively restored. And the assessment of the harms is entirely left uh, to victims' perceptions. In crime prevention, the, uh, the relevance of harm is not prima facie uh, evident because um, many programs do not make an explicit reference to harm. However, there are some documents that do that. For example, the UN guidelines on, on crime prevention uh, define crime prevention as strategies and measures that seek to reduce the risk of crime occurring and their potential harmful effects on individual and society. But here, too, there has been no conceptualization, operationalization, or assessment of harm. And lastly, that's the last uh, of the criminal policy phases, uh, harm is central uh, to reparation uh, in uh, uh, international criminal justice. International criminal justice is certainly, no doubt, more restorative uh, than domestic criminal justice. For example, the International Criminal Court has to establish principles relating to reparations uh, to or in respect of victims. There is a trust fund that has to implement uh, these court decisions to restore the harms to the victims. However, the International Criminal Court has been criticized for its uh, uh, traditional retributive approach and for lacking a framework, okay, even an expertise, in assessing uh, the harms that need to be restored. So before I move on and present you my, our conceptualization of harm, let me just sum up the argument so far. What have we seen? We have seen the harms is central to both crime and the societal uh, responses to crime. 
and that its centrality emerges forcefully from legal history uh, and legal theory. However, we have also seen that a considerable part of academia and officialdom tend to see crime as harms, and therefore fails to acknowledge the link, but also the separation between the two, and to act on them. We have also seen there have been very few conceptualization and even fewer empirical assessment of harms. We have also seen uh, that the relevance of harm emerges from many different phases of criminal policy, but uh, has been acknowledged to different degrees in different policies. And as you see here, and in this table, Victoria and I have tried then, to summarize uh, these findings. For example, you see that the relevance of harm is most manifest in criminalization, sentencing, victim assistance, and restorative justice, as well as in reparations in international criminal justice. It is instead more rarely spelled out in crime control and prevention, albeit harm is gaining uh, recognition as a guiding principle even in these uh, two phases. In no phases, though, has harm or harm-based approach been conceptualized or implemented fully, even, if, even when it has been taken on board in formal uh, policy statements. And, uh, you know, I'm originally Italian, so uh, I thought at a certain point of our work that uh, there is uh, the sinking streams that are associated with cars formations, which are known in Italian as carcismo, are a nice analogy, a nice metaphor, metaphor for what we observe. Namely, like those streams, harms is sometimes manifest and sometimes buried, but in nonetheless, like the water huh? in, uh, this, uh, in the cars formation, but nonetheless is almost there. Let me now briefly spell out our conceptualization of harm. Victoria and I conceptualize harm as a setback to legitimate interests, drawing on Feinberg. Uh, we acknowledge that our concept is as, much as is as much as crime a normative concept. However, we believe that harm is an advantage vis-a-vis -vis crime, namely that it forces its users to spell out what are the positive interests that ones care about. A harm is always a harm to something or to somebody. You, cannot hardly, you can hardly speak of harm in general. And in particular, then, Victoria and I have developed a taxonomy of harms that should say give practical meaning to our definitions. And we consider, in particular, harms to four categories of bearers. They are um, so individuals, private sector entities, including businesses and uh, NGOs, the government, so therefore the state, and both the social and the physical environments. And these entities uh, can suffer uh, harms to different dimensions, so functional integrity, material support, reputation, and privacy and autonomies. And we see these interest dimensions as capabilities, a la sen, so as pathways to a certain standards of living, or by analogy to, for the case of the entities, to a, a certain institutional uh, missions. And then Victoria and I have developed the harm assessment framework, which consists of a set of tools that are woven together in a multi-step process. And this framework can be used to identify, evaluate, rank, and prioritize harms. The tools in order of applications are, first of all, a template, with which we reconstruct the business model, so the narrative of a crime, the script of a crime. Then we use the taxonomy that I just showed you to identify the possible harms. And then we have two scales, one to assess the severity and one to assess the uh, frequency, the incidence of crime. And by combining these two scales, we develop a prioritization matrix so that we can decide which harms devote, uh, deserve uh, uh, the highest uh, priority. Because a harm might be catastrophic, but if it happens only very rarely, it might merit less attention than, a than, a, uh, mm, than an event that is less harmful but uh, then a harm that is uh, less seriously harmful, but uh, occurs much more frequently. So the matrix offers a preliminary basis for addressing the issue of uh, incommensurability. And as you see, we are using both qualitative and quantitative data. Also because although Victoria is an economist by training, we, uh, uh, we admit that not all harms can be monetarized or can be quantified, and therefore, Indeed, I think that 
an advantage of the framework is that it can serve also uh, as a rapid assessment when in conditions in which not all harms are available. And then importantly, the final uh, step of the framework is establishing the causality of the harm. And here for that uh, step, we don't have uh, uh, a tool, but we proceed in two steps. So first of all, we assess the remoteness of the harms to the crime, because some, crime, some harms might be a direct consequences of, uh, uh, of, uh, of a crime, but some are not. For example, are the harms of drug use a consequence of drug trafficking or not? And then it's important also to assess the dependence of harms on the policy, because some of the harms associated with crime, think again of the harms of drug trafficking, depend on our policies and not really uh, on the criminal activity itself. Let me now conclude by showing you the potential contributions of harm assessment. Victoria and I believe that uh, uh, indeed uh, the uh, assessment, empirical systematic assessment of the harms can uh, feed into, can inform normative deliberations in many policy phases. First of all, and most fundamentally, whether or not an activity should be uh, criminalized. So the harm assessment can be used to consider whether an activity is harmful enough uh, to be criminalized or whether criminalizing a non-harmful activity, for example, uh, speed driving, uh, is really helpful in preventing harm, even if speed driving not necessarily is harmful in itself, for example. Second, the comparison of the harms across different uh, types of already criminal activities can provide initial evidence for setting uh, both strategic and tactical priorities for prevention, and uh, uh, more broadly also for the public-private governance of security. One might, for example, be able to rank activities on the basis of the harmfulness, even if uh, the uh, strategic priorities are not set just on the basis of harms. Uh, and indeed, this is what Beccaria uh, called for doing already in, uh, so in, uh, on crimes and punishment. Uh, but his call has uh, he, he asked uh, for a scale of the crimes depending on their seriousness, but this call has never been fully addressed. And the, the identifications, so the comparative assessment might also lead to the identification of especially harmful perpetrators or places or victims who suffer most harm, as uh, Peter uh, has already uh, talked about. The assessment uh, might also help uh, policymakers contrast the priorities established on the basis of what I, we would call the objective security, so on the basis of uh, an empirical systematic assessment of the harms with uh, uh, the subjective uh, security, namely with the people's perceptions. And if uh, democracy is governed by discussions on this basis, one can start a dialogue with the public by showing that what they fear is most harmful is not necessarily the most harmful thing. And considering the field of prevention, considering that preventative offenses are more and more frequently uh, enacted and that lots of coercive preventive measures are adopted, the, our assessment of the causality of the harm might uh, show, might help us to see if some of these measures are really appropriate, are really helpful in uh, preventing some harms or the harms that are, uh, or the harmful activities that are being criminalized are just too remote uh, from uh, the harms themselves. Assessing just the uh, severity of the harms, irrespective of the incidents, can obviously feed into then uh, uh, better uh, sentencing guidelines, or um, it can really then ensure the proportionality of sanctions, because this empirical exercise has never been done. It can also help us identify appropriate sanctions, appropriate restorative sanctions, huh? so sanctions that are not just aiming at re retributive aims. And in the fields of victim programs, restorative justice, and reparations, a harm assessment can help extend the reach beyond ordinary crimes and beyond individual victims. And so, huh? Because, for example, in victimology, the harms to uh, corporate entities or government entities are very much neglected. And here, too, it can assure the proportionality of the reactions. And the 
Analysis of the harms, in our view, also provides for what economists call a, basela a baseline estimate against which policymakers can evaluate policies and, and assess the effects of policy changes. This would begin with the evaluation of the net consequences of the current policy, coupled with an uh, uh, estimation of uh, the implementation cost. And Victor and I uh, advocate for a truly net analysis of the harms. That is an analysis that also accounts for the benefits, the possible benefits of a criminalized activity. Failing to account for these benefits, for example, the benefits of opiate, uh, opium production in Afghanistan, could obviously uh, bias uh, the results. And Victoria and I then, once you have the assessment of the harms and the fall of the benefits of a specific policy, and you assess also the, the implementation cost, you, ha you have to repeat this uh, kind of assessment even on the basis of a kind of scenario analysis with an alternative policy or with a no policy scenario. And on this basis, you can compare the results across policy options and then see whether or not the current policy is really worth doing or whether instead, for example, it provokes more harms than it solves. So, and Victoria and I speak of a notional cost-benefit analysis because we uh, realize that not all benefits, the reductions in harms, can be uh, quantified or monetized. And coming to my final slides. To conclude, uh, what, have you, what have been trying to argue so far? Harm is central to crime, to criminal policy, and although I didn't have time to show it to you, Victoria and I argue in our book that harm is also central to the governance of security. I believe that I've shown you, hopefully convincingly, that the empirical assessment of harm can inform normative deliberations and provide evidence for the evaluation of the related interventions. Uh, although our harm assessment is not specifically related with policing, it seems to me that it fits very nicely with uh, Hermann Goldstein's idea of uh, uh, problem-oriented policing. Indeed, it can help us overcome uh, the means uh, over N syndrome, of which uh, uh, he started talking about, huh? because uh, it can help us both identify better the problems, huh? that not just the police, but we as society ought to care about, and also then uh, really then assess after the intervention whether or not the problems have been, uh, uh, have been dealt with, have been reduced. And ultimately, Victoria and I see the assessment of the harms of criminalized and even not yet criminalized activities as diagnosis of injustice a la sen. Uh, we refer here to the magisterial work of uh, uh, the Anglo-Indian uh, economist and uh, ethicist philosopher Amartya Sen. And therefore as a strategy of judging how to reduce injustice and advance justice. Here our understanding of justice very much relies on sense understanding of justice and sense uh, moves from Rawls, who was really emphasizing the, um, uh, the quest of the perfectly just institutions and Sen instead conceived justice in terms of social realizations and specifically the capabilities that people actually have uh, to deal a good life, uh, to, to have a good life. And such capabilities represent, uh, constitute the benchmark in our framework for gauging the severity of the harms to individuals. And to clarify his position, uh, Sen discusses two conceptions of justice in the Indian, in the early Indian jurisprudence. The one is niti, which has to do with the uh, um, with the adequacy of the procedures of the institutions and the rules. You could compare it with uh, criminal and procedural justice. And the other notion uh, of justice is nyaya, huh? which is very much focused on, uh, uh, on realization and is much more closely linked to what we call distributive justice. And uh, Sen, with the idea of comprehensive outcomes, finds a way of reconciling the two. But obviously his preference, and also our preference, goes very much in the direction of the nyaya. So we really care on the outcomes, the final outcomes of the policies. And we believe that the harm assessment is a way of, of finding out 
whether we are causing harm or instead we are reducing harms through our, um, uh, through our uh, intervention, through our policy interventions. And as Adam Smith did, we see justice and security as closely intertwined rather than as opposed, and it is routinely done in criminology. And this understanding of justice and security is also in line with sense idea and the whole idea of human security as free from want and free from fear that is now advocated by the United Nations. Lastly, the empirical assessment of the harms reminds criminology of what um, uh, Kitchen, a philosophy of science, has called the fundamental question, namely, what is the collective good that we want to, the inquiry to promote? And Victoria and my answer to that fundamental question is pretty clear, namely, promoting justice and security through harm reduction. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Let's start with any uh, quick qu uh, clarifying questions for the teacher. I'll start off with just three tiny ones, um, then general question time uh, to either of our speakers. Um, you've given us a fabulous tour of the underlying philo philosophy, uh, the legal territory, the history, um, the parts of the criminal justice system where this might apply. Um, I'm uh, going to ask you a very practical question, being a practical person. Mm -hmm. Uh, for you to apply this assessment framework, um, objects have to be graded uh, in terms of their uh, severity and their incidence. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to know who does the grading and um, whether a huge amount of subjectivity is either introduced or avoided um, at that particular point. I know from some of your other writings that you've uh, sometimes used uh, public surveys in Belgium to get the public to tell you which things are regarded as more severe than others. Um, um, is, is that more or less democratic than using existing sentencing guidelines that have been developed through some other technique? Um, exactly who, do, who does the, um, the grading? No, so um, severity and Victoria incidents. and I have, uh, certainly we would not leave the assessment of the severity and the incidence to the public. And indeed, I have done some work on uh, public perceptions of crime. Right. I've just published an article uh, right. on this. Um, but to show that these public seriousness perceptions are wrong, <laughs> not to use them in the harm assessment, to show that they are unreliable. Uh, because, uh, first of all, the public uh, has, I mean, has no clear uh, criteria in its uh, assessment huh, of uh, the seriousness. Um, it has no data to do that. So, and fundamentally, our, uh, and there is a, an even more fundamental objection, namely that we, in our work uh, with several colleagues, we have found out that, that these public um, perceptions are fundamentally driven by the perceived moral wrongfulness of the offense, and they are not driven by the, the perceived harm. uh, harmfulness of the offense. Right. So, and that's why we show that even the sentencing guidelines that rely on uh, public seriousness perceptions uh, might be wrong. Huh? So that, uh, uh, of course, you could argue that, I mean, that's democracy. Huh? So, and as a democratic country, you have to, uh, I mean, reflect, reflect uh, in your policies uh, what, the, uh, what the polity, what the public uh, sees as important. But the whole purpose of Victoria and our work is to provide elements so for better normative decisions. Indeed, we realize most decis the decisions about the goals in criminal policies are normative decisions. And we as scientists have no special authority uh, uh, to decide uh, what these decisions should do. But we believe that it's our responsibility uh, as scientists to provide evidence on which uh, uh, these decisions should be based. So th I think you've answered my question that the judgment is to be made by experts, yes, not by the public, yeah. and using a set of criteria that you've yes, laid out or a indeed. process yes. especially, to, to guide them. Especially for the seriousness, we use the idea of the standard of living huh, as the benchmark for assessing how severe harm is, huh? so yes. whether harm is catastrophic, so that really 
results in uh, the individual uh, uh, dying or the entity that is no longer able to function or at the other extreme whether the harm is uh, marginal. So, huh? And here we rely on a uh, sense idea of standards of living which uses a kind of mid-term period. So for example, if somebody slaps you on the face, so, uh, you might be uh, you might get red, a uh, red cheek, huh? but in the midterm, this would be a marginal harm because there is no major harm huh, to your functional integrity. And this expert guidance, you're going to use a lot of the economic uh, modeling about yeah. uh, willingness to accept uh, will, and what people will pay to avoid a particular form of victimization. No, we would not use that. So uh, indeed, huh? so we really try to assess the harms huh, rather than. Uh, uh, the cost of the crimes. So, because uh, again, so Victoria is an economist, so we have uh, no principal objection to quantifications. Right. However, there are problems in, uh, yes. uh, in monetarizing, yeah. in trying to monetarize everything. Huh? Right. So, and in particular, we believe, for example, one of our interest dimensions is material support. Huh? So, huh? And obviously, for this dimension, uh, we are very open uh, to quantification and yep. monet uh, monetarizations. Yep. But there are other harms, for example, harms to privacy, uh, harms to autonomy. Uh, and these harms can be pretty significant things, for example, human trafficking. If somebody takes away your passport, uh, if you are kidnapped uh, and kept uh, uh, hostage uh, so in a given place. These are significant harms, but in our opinion, cannot be fully express expressed in monetary terms. Okay, My, uh, uh, one other practical clarification. A uh, PETA system takes everything and scores it and then uh, can essentially convert an entire map of crime data and produce a map of all of the homes. Mm -hmm. um, are you proposing your system as universal in that way or is it going to be done selectively um, on issues of particular concern? And if so, what are the triggers um, that would actually launch the use of your assessment model? Well. I mean, that's a bit what I hinted at in the beginning. So Victoria and I realized that our assessment is uh, certainly more cumbersome, uh, cumbersome than Peter's is, but we see it as complementary. So if, uh, I mean, once priorities are set for criminal policies, so once goals are set for criminal policies, then I have no problems using uh, Peter's instrument to see whether or not the police is meeting these priorities. Okay. But I think that there must be a fundamental discussion also on the, ha on the aims of criminal policies, so yes. on what we try to achieve uh, through criminal policy and through regulations. And our instrument uh, fundamentally aims to inform these normative decisions about the aims rather than about the means so, huh, with okay. which to achieve these aims. Very good. Uh, questions? Uh, it's two, two right at the front here to begin. Uh, I, I thought the presentations were really complimentary, so it covered a superb span. Uh, ultimately, though, when you come down to it, aren't you trying to put some qualitative measures on what are essentially quantitative criteria? So, for example, if, if we take Peter's uh, presentation, Ult ultimately what we have is what's reported to the public. So however that's done, uh, you, you then, by categorizing the different types of crime and adding them up, you, you put a qualitative measure. But for me, isn't harm more intangible and it's multi-layered? And some of the worst harm environments, for example, intimidation, non-reporting would be more rife. So wouldn't you ultimately be left with a lot issues around harm which you would never be able to capture because you can't capture the quantity? And then a sort of supplementary question, which is less one. Peter, do you think there's a proxy indicator? So if you were to just punch your button and say, look at knife crime, it would show the same trends as, as uh, the total harm index. You want to do your, your piece of that question first? Uh, the, so the question was about what's not captured. Um, is it harder to capture in, in direct effects? Is it harder to spot uh, uh, the parts of invisible crimes? Um, would they be adequately dealt with by your framework? I think, I mean, one of the advantages, perhaps also the complications of our framework, is really its breadth. So, but it seems to me that it has, for example, the potential 
uh, to be applied even to non-criminal problems. Huh? So, huh? Uh, we have developed this framework originally to, because we wanted to help uh, the Belgian police set up its strategic priorities uh, so in the fight against crime. But there is nothing that really constrains the frame or the uses of the frame just to crime. You can use it. And for example, there is a PhD student of mine who is doing a, a study on harms in the, in the meat industry. So you could even use it, as I mentioned, to see whether something should be criminalized or not. And, uh, and it seems to me that it also gives you an assessment. It gives you the possibility to assess whether it's correct, for example, to uh, to criminalize an, an activity that is not harmful in itself. Huh? Uh, as I said, for example, speed driving is not inherently harmful because many people huh, drive too fast and still cause no harm. Uh, is it still, does it make sense to criminalize it? Huh? Because by criminalizing it, uh, you are preventing harm or not. And it seems to me that also with, these, uh, with the taxonomy that we have, we can capture harms to different bearers and uh, uh, different interest dimensions. So I think that it's, um, um, it's I don't see limitations uh, so in terms of uh, things that are not captured. And I really think that uh, this harm assessment has the potential to, uh, to improve the way we set up goals. Huh? For example, even with reference huh, to, uh, to Peter's uh, method, if the sentencing guidelines are wrong, then the whole crime index is wrong. And we don't know if they're wrong or not, huh? because uh, 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 they might reflect the democratic process, but they're not really informed by an empirical assessment of the harms. Peter, your piece of the puzzle. So, so there's, a, there's quite a few issues bound up in your question, one of which is clearly the, the challenge of you doing anything with police-recorded crime data, because there are some types of crime and some types of harm that are less recorded um, and, and then, in fact, more difficult to record. Uh, but even when we look at things like domestic violence, which, uh, which, which has had until quite recently um, in the UK a pretty, a pretty low level of recording, uh, well, that has significantly improved. Um, we, we, we still get, a, we still get a, a, a position where something that's sit, sitting, sitting in, in amongst a, lo a, a load of other data for, for, for volume. So, I mean, the real, the real challenge for me, for me practically was what happened when we were just focused as, a, as police forces, and the UK was by no means alone in this, on burglaries and vehicle crimes and, and the, the, the kind of the mass acquisitive crimes. And, the, and other crimes sat at the other end of the other end of the scale. They were a kind of 20% of something, and we didn't pay that much attention to the prevention. I'm also I can also remember being very clearly told by someone in the Home Office, "No, we don't pay attention to that. We can't prevent murder." And you think, well, actually, <laughs> we we probably can. And indeed, when it comes to domestic violence, we most definitely should seek to prevent murder. So. For me, what, the, what running the crime harm index alongside, even with the inadequacies and difficulties of recorded crime data, is that suddenly you're seeing a picture in a different way. It's a different mirror you're looking in. And that, in policing terms, makes a big difference to the, to the equation. Whether you could use one crime... I mean, it's an interesting idea, whether you could use one crime as an index, to, as, a, as a proxy. The only thing I'd say about that is that, for example, knife crime would be tricky because would you include... Um, you know, for example, arrest for possession of knives, because the problem with that is that that would be materially affected by the amount of police action. And probably the answer to that is, you, you, you know, you're back now to proper, to proper problem solving. You, you first use the data you've got, so the recorded crime data. That gives you the, the starting point, the picture. It's the entry point into, your, into, the, into priorities. And then you might layer on arrests for and other activity data and start to think about the picture. I don't claim that the crime harm index uh, is, well, it probably is actually almost as robust as, a, as recorded crime data because, frankly, that's not that difficult a standard to meet. But I, I, wouldn't, I would not rely wholly on, the, on a crime harm index as your one measure. But what I would point out is that as we've increasingly seen, you know, C Canada and, and Australia and New Zealand and other countries starting to develop this, we do start to see a very different picture of the priorities and it seems to me that it's entirely consistent 
with, with the way that police are increasingly pressured to deal with crimes such as domestic violence, such as human trafficking. It, pr crimes that have, traditionally haven't fitted that well into, the, into crime recording. They're relatively lower volume, but in fact, in terms of harm, very, much, very significantly high. And, I, and you're right, I'm very glad what you did spot in that process is just how consistent what, uh, what we've been talking about is. That I'm, you know, the reason I hugely value Letitia's work is it seems it provides that depth of understanding about, uh, about what I think has become, until quite recently, quite a neglected area of, of, of this territory. And, the, and there's been too much emphasis on, on volume and, and activity and far too little on harms and how we might actually balance and, and the, the, the harms and benefits in the debate. Second question here. Yep. Uh, yeah, Mike Barton, thank you. Um, I, I was reflecting on John Stuart Mill and I was intrigued by Letitia's aside about the Afghan opium harvest. Do the different <laughs> approaches, the economic and the sentencing, give us a different prism to judge drug possession and drug dealing? Well, it definitely does, um, and indeed, uh, Victoria and I started to become interested in this area because both of us have done a lot of work on drug policy, and one of our first as empirical assessment of the harms uh, has been assessing the harms of cocaine trafficking in, uh, uh, in Belgium. And uh, what we found out was quite surprising. So first of all, although Belgium is really one of the main entry points for Latin American cocaine because it has the second largest uh, European port, uh, the port of Antwerp, there were to Belgium very, very little harms uh, arising from cocaine trafficking for Belgium itself, huh? not for, we're not considering harms to Colombia, for example. <laughs> and then the other finding was that, uh, I mean, most of the harms uh, and we were considered not just the harms of cocaine trafficking, but also the harms of the related activities, what we call the accompanying activities, so violence, the use of violence, corruption, and money laundering. So most of the harms that we found were due to our policy choices, were due to the fact that cocaine is, uh, is criminal, because there would be no murders, there would be no corruption, there would be no uh, swallowers dying because a cocaine ball explodes if cocaine were legal. That doesn't mean, and we stress that very strongly, it doesn't mean that we should legalize cocaine. It does not mean that. But it means, well, that with our policies, we are now currently causing harm in the supply side, on the supply side of the market and that somebody should equate whether or not the harms that we, through our policies, are causing on the supply side are higher or smaller than the harms that we are preventing on the demand side by criminalizing cocaine. It could be that in the end, at the end of the empirical assessment, we come to the conclusion that it makes sense to criminalize cocaine, because indeed we are preventing more harms than we cause. But this is something that has not been yet empirically assessed, and I think it ought to be. I'm very conscious of the time. I'm hoping to squeeze in on at least two short questions. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, more of an observation. Um, there seems to be a terrific resistance in policy, practice, and even research circles to getting to grips with the basic scholarship, the, on the ontology of defining key terms and concepts in um, in criminology like harm and also um, I've had a great battle to try and get people to define crime in crime science and it's 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 half the phrase um, and uh, years ago when I was in the home office we came up after much work with a really developed definition of community safety um, and then it was junked by some new administrator that came in with some other bright <laughs> idea. So I wish there was more of this sort of thing. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Going? Going? Uh, go on. Thank you very much for being here. Let's thank the panel members. Here. Thank you. Thank you.